Still morning. Good morning, everybody. We uh, welcome you all to here uh, to be here to this uh, budget briefing. Uh, we've already had uh, this done twice, and we'll probably do it 732 times uh, more uh, in the next uh, few days. Uh, but we want to try to make this as uh, you know as transparent as we possibly can. Uh, we thank you all for very much for being here. Um, we're going to try to provide, you know, a uh, somewhat, I won't say high altitude, but certainly not down into the, all the details because there are the details right there. And as you can see, uh, there's a lot of detail in those books, and we're not going to go through all that today. We're going to try to give you some general directions, some numbers uh, associated with that, and uh, then we'll try to take questions uh, at this stage. Recognizing that commencing today will be a 56-day period uh, in which the council will review uh, the budgets, it will um, convene hearings uh, beginning next week. So we'll have a lot of um, we'll have a lot of interaction around this budget as often as the case, and then presumably by May 15th, uh, we will come to some conclusions as a city uh, on the budget. Uh, before I begin. Uh, we has, have worked again this year very closely uh, with the Chief Financial Officer uh, and his staff, and I want to first of all thank Dr. Gandhi, and I want to thank his staff for being great partners in helping be able to bring us to the point where we are today to be able to present uh, this budget. And before we start to get into the details, I'd like to invite him up to say a few words, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When we went to Wall Street in February under mayor's leadership, the district delegation, <clears throat> we had committed, the mayor had committed to financial markets and the rating agencies that as mayor crafts his budget, that it would be structurally balanced. It's a fancy word for making sure that we would not spend anything more than what we take in. Two, that that would also mean that we will not use any fund balance, our so-called saving account, that we had used roughly $700 million during the past four years, and that we would remain within our so-called debt cap. 12% of the budget should be all that should go towards the debt services. So 88 cents of a dollar available for services to our citizens. All that would mean that the budget would be fiscally prudent budget that reflects financially responsible budgeting. And uh, Mr. Mayor, the budget that we have put together does just that. I have certified this budget as balanced for the year 2003 and for our financial plan and that our capital budget, the borrowing that we will do in future would maintain the debt, 12 percent debt cap for the entire plan period. With this budget, I'm quite comfortable we can go back to Wall Street and make sure that our ratings are as confirmed and remain there, and that we will be able to make a case for increased credibility, more credibility than we already enjoy, which is truly unparalleled in city's history. We enjoy AAA bond ratings on our income tax bonds and AA A plus ratings on our GO bonds. We are a welcome presence on Wall Street, and with this budget, we will remain that way. So I'm very happy, Mr. Mayor, to suggest uh, that we are fiscally prudent and that with this budget and a five-year plan, will remain that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gandhi. And again, thank you for being uh, in this journey, on this journey with us all the way. I hope everybody has a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, we'll try to walk through this. Uh, so hopefully you will get a sense of some of the, uh, the uh, efforts that we're making for fiscal year 2013, which in substantial part is designed to build on fiscal year 2012. Um, the theme of this budget is seizing our future, which was the same theme that we used for the uh, state of the district uh, address. 
uh, trying to um, uh, build upon uh, some important uh, issues that we're focusing on as a part of this administration. Uh, the first slide uh, establishes the budget goals. Uh, one, to diversify and grow the uh, district's economy. Uh, two, to educate and prepare our workforce for the uh, new economy. And uh, three, to improve the quality of life uh, for all people here in the city. There are four principles that upon which those goals are developed. Uh, one, to uh, continue to prioritize strategic investments in education, uh, public safety, and workforce development, which are inextricably tied. Uh, continuing to try to do the best job we can to protect our most vulnerable residents. And uh, I don't think there's any question we would be the first ones to, to make the uh, statement that um, we wish that there were more that could be done. Uh, we have a difficult uh, situation that we are facing in fiscal year 13, um, and we are unable to fund all the needs that there are. We will, you will see at the end uh, of this, uh, of this uh, presentation uh, what we are advancing to the council is a set of needs that we believe are important enough if there is additional money uh, available to the city that should be funded. And we've been quite specific uh, with those. Uh, they total $120 million. We have no idea if and how much additional money will come into the city, uh, but that number is based on what occurred last year. How much money in the aggregate came in in the June September and December uh, revenue estimates. So we use that as a baseline to say here's a set, you know, we'll go down the list as far as we can uh, if there is new money that comes in while this budget is being uh, crafted and while it's uh, unfolding either before the fiscal year begins or in the uh, first quarter of the fiscal year. So again, and I'll go over some of those items when we get to that. Thoroughly, you heard Dr. Gandhi talk about a structurally balanced budget. We are not using any fund balance to balance this budget. That is an unwinnable proposition because eventually you have no bank account uh, in which to reach, and uh, we have uh, avoided that once again this fiscal year. Uh, as you will see, this is the third consecutive year. We had a surplus in fiscal year 11 uh, that resulted in us not having to use any fund balance for 11. We balanced 12 the current fiscal year on the basis of what comes in the door, and we're doing the same thing for uh, 13. And also, there are no new taxes uh, or fees that are proposed uh, in this budget. The first of the four principles is strategic investments. And we are continuing to make investments in education, uh, public safety, and workforce development. And let me start, beginning with uh, slide five, to talk about investments in education. Um, we are making 85, almost $86 million uh, in additional investments in, in the uh, D.C. public schools and D.C. charter schools. Uh, we are fully funding enrollment increases, projected enrollment increases, which total about $64 uh, million uh, between the two approaches to public education, as well as a 2 percent increase uh, in the funding formula uh, itself for another $22 uh, million. So that totals the 85, almost $86 million. We also obviously as a part of that are using our savings in non-public tuition uh, to invest, uh, reinvest, I might say, in, in what we call inclusive uh, public education. And that is a fancy term for saying that children with disabilities deserve the right to be served in our public schools just like anybody else, and we are expanding that. When we started this journey, some of you will remember last year we had a little over 2,200 children uh, in non-public tuition placements, which means we were paying for them uh, outside uh, of the uh, city uh, in many instances, uh, but in private schools. Uh, we now are down to uh, slightly, around, uh, slightly above 1,700 children, and we are reflecting in this budget uh, in a budget of $108 million, which over a period of about uh, 18 months will reflect a reduction from about 160 to $70 million in how much we're paying in that area. And we continue to reinvest in building capacity in our public sector to serve these children. We also will see um, over time that reflected in our transportation systems as well. Uh, we're going to, in this budget, uh, begin investing in uh, training the children that we can to use the metro uh, system. 
uh, which will be far less expensive than using the buses or vans that they ride on in many instances now. And also, by bringing children closer to home in terms of their services, there will be a need for fewer buses uh, and fewer long trips, if you will. We have children who are bused as far away as Baltimore uh, each day uh, to be in programs there, and that is just not, I don't think it's either efficient or effective, to tell you the truth. And we have an obligation to build those services in the city, which we're going to do. Uh, in addition to that, on slide six, you see that we're going to invest in um, early childhood uh, education. I certainly wanted to do more, uh, but we're going to invest a million dollars and 75 new slots to expand our infant and toddler programs. I believe that over a period of years, we ought to move towards universality in serving infants and toddlers, just as we've done with the uh, pre-kindergarten uh, group, the ages three and four uh, population. We should do the same thing uh, there as well. And I'm absolutely convinced that over a period of years, these services will pay for themselves by the number of children who don't wind up truanting, who don't wind up in special education, who don't wind up in juvenile justice, and ultimately don't wind up in our adult criminal justice uh, system uh, as a result. These are not investments that necessarily pay immediate dividends, but they will pay enormous dividends uh, over a period of years, not the least of which, frankly, will be an opportunity to work very directly with uh, young parents and to make this compatible as, as we work with young parents to try to get them back to work, being, have, being able to have a reliable uh, support system for their very long, young children, I think will be a source of comfort uh, as well as uh, services uh, to uh, those folks. For the first time in a number of years, we'll have a small increase in the University of the District of Columbia, $1.2 million, um, $1.3 million. Uh, for UDC, and there'll be others I'll talk about in a second in that area. Um, they, again, think the university wants more, and I wish we had more, but we don't. Um, we are creating a truancy prevention grant program in the uh, Justice Grants Administration, which will build on the work of uh, Deputy Mayor Wright and Judge Bush, uh, Superior Court Judge Bush, around truancy prevention, we want to now start to roll out not only an awareness program, which we've already rolled out, but now grants to organizations to help us intervene and prevent truancy. Uh, truancy means that children, right now the definition I think is they don't, they're absent 25 days in a year uh, from school. We're going to reduce that threshold to 20, and we're going to reach out in more intensive ways to try to get these children reconnected uh, with school. We also are finishing a new facility at Rosedale that will include a library, and this budget will include positions to be able to open that library at 17th and Gale Street, 17th and Benning Road uh, as well. Um, we also uh, are going to, in this fiscal plan, we will be completing high school modernization over the years of this plan. This is a six-year uh, fiscal plan to do that, uh, $649 million uh, for high school modernization and $203 million that will be spent in fiscal year 2013 alone. That will include the beginning of the construction of a new Baloo High School. The design is underway now. The construction of Cardozo, or the modernization, I should say, of Cardozo, and the construction of a new Dunbar already are underway, and they will be completed, those two, in time for the opening of the 2013-2014 school year. And then we're going to move apace uh, with the other three high schools that have to be addressed, uh, Ellington, uh, Coolidge and Roosevelt, and uh, as you look at our high schools, you will see that they either have been substan all will have been substantially modernized, they all will have been rebuilt, uh, or changes will have been made in order to reflect a fully modernized uh, 9 through 12 program. We're also accelerating middle school modernization. Uh, the six-year capital plan has over $218 million that will be invested in modernizing middle schools. It will involve the construction of two new, two new middle schools in Ward 5 and the complete modernization of all existing uh, middle schools uh, in the city. Um, there will be, uh, in 2013, almost $74 million invested. Uh, there will be planning as well as some construction done on four middle schools in 13 and uh, Johnson Middle School, as well as Stuart Hobson, will be a uh, focal point. I think we will be investing in Stuart Hobson, 33 or 34 million dollars. Uh, is that right, Eric? In uh, the next fiscal year to complete the modernization there. 
We also are establishing as a part of our continuing uh, effort to expand STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. We are going to create a $1 million challenger uh, center. Uh, that will be at Langley School. Uh, it will be for space science education. We now have the first ever uh, STEM campus in the city. Langley is a pre-K through eight school. Next door, a matter of feet away, is McKinley, which is nine through 12. And this will add to our capacity uh, there to do that. Uh, in addition to that, the, um, the, there will be a focus over six years, $632 million. We're on page nine for those who are following along. $632 million of investment in elementary school modernization. Uh, and $47 million of that will be invested in 2013 uh, in, the, uh, in the elementary schools. Um, there will be 12 elementary schools that will be subject to various forms of modernization in 2013. Uh, we also will have over six years an investment of $178 million in capital investments in the University of the District of Columbia. A centerpiece of that <clears throat> will be uh, the new student center, which uh, is already underway, and we'll spend $39 million on that in fiscal year 2013, and it should be close to completion by the end of next fiscal year. Uh, on page 10, we talk about our public safety <clears throat> investments. The um, police department will be increased by $20.5 million in local funds that will allow us to support a full, uh, full uh, force of 3,907 uh, sworn officers. I think the concern arises when you get down to about 3,800. We're not going to allow ourselves to get close to that. We will have 107 more officers on the streets uh, to be able to address the, the panoply of issues around uh, crime in the city. Um, we are actually replacing a COPS grant that we had, a federal grant that we had for several years, $3.4 million uh, that we've now lost, not lost, but it, it, it expired. Uh, and it was the federal government is not renewing any of these cop, COPS grants uh, around the country. So we invested $3.4 million in order to ensure that those 50 officers will continue to be available. Uh, there was a program that was established back in the uh, 90s. Uh, it's called Base uh, Retention Differential. And what it does is uh, try to create incentives to keep officers longer than the threshold <clears throat> of 20 uh, years uh, for them to retire. And now it's coming due. It will cost us $7.8 million in fiscal year 13 to be able to do that. It is a contractual commitment that was made. I think it's in a collective bargaining agreement, actually. And uh, we need to be able to fulfill that in fiscal year 13. Um, $5.8 million will be invested in automated traffic enforcement to improve driver, bicyclists, and pedestrian safety uh, through additional traffic calming uh, initiatives. I don't know how many of you saw the uh, report about the accident that occurred on 295 uh, yesterday, where there were two cars racing, one of them uh, clipped the side of a pickup truck. <clears throat> it flipped over uh, and went down, I don't know, 150 to 200 feet along the guardrail. Uh, the person who was an innocent victim driving the pickup truck uh, is in very, very serious condition uh, at this stage. And somebody who is an innocent victim of, of people who were not driving uh, responsibly on 295. Um, we also are civilianizing 29 positions that will get uh, 29 more sworn officers on patrol uh, in the city, uh, keep taking them out of administrative positions and putting them out on the streets. Um, in addition to that, we are uh, launching the Department of Forensic Sciences uh, on October 1st. Uh, we will have what I think will be uh, arguably the finest forensic, uh, the consolidated lab, uh, that is, as it often is called, in the nation. And that will be launched on October 1st. Uh, that will bring together a lot of elements of MPD, uh, the Department of Health, uh, and also uh, the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner will relocate uh, to uh, this new building. For those who don't know where it is, if you just drive down the southeast southwest freeway, if you're going west, you look off to your right. If you're going east, uh, you look off to, uh, if you're going east, you look off to your left. Uh, it's around 4th Street, 5th Street. Um, and it's, I don't know, G Street, H Street, or somewhere. But it really is quite an impressive building. And I think will put us in the forefront uh, of these kind of efforts nationally. 
We will be launching our streetcar program in 2013, and uh, <clears throat> the first line will be operational. And uh, we are going to establish an independent safety inspection program apart from DDOT, which will be involved in running it. That will be operated as it is in some other cities uh, a, by the uh, FMES, and they will inspect the operation uh, of the streetcar in a variety of ways to ensure public safety. Uh, on page 12, we uh, set out um, the fact that the 6th District, um, we are going to move that from its current location at 42nd and Benning Road, uh, and we'll relocate uh, to the former Merritt Middle School, which has been closed now for three or four years. It's going to be renovated. I uh, don't know the exact period of time that it will take to renovate the, uh, the Merritt School but it will be a, a wonderful new location for the people uh, in Ward 7 in the 6th uh, District. Um, we also are going to renovate and relocate eight fire stations during fiscal year 13 uh, and continue to improve our first responders training facility, which is down at Blue Plains. Uh, we're, going to, we're proposing to invest $28 million in the uh, Office of Communications uh, facility which is located on the east side of the St. Elizabeth's campus. It has been and we want it to continue to be a premier um, uh, a place for um, a lot of our homeland security uh, operations. So that investment will be made in 2013 as well. In terms of workforce development, over a period of six years we are proposing to invest $113 million in infrastructure upgrades on the St. Elizabeth's east campus. Uh, there will be $58 million that we're proposing in fiscal year 13. For those who are familiar with the campus, you know that it has an archaic, uh, long outdated infrastructure. Uh, roads, uh, energy, uh, almost anything you can name uh, requires to be upgraded. We intend to make that a, an IT uh, hub in the District of Columbia. We are proposing to create <clears throat> a center for innovation and entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship uh, on the east side of the campus. Um, on the west side, uh, even though Homeland Security is likely not coming, uh, at least if you look at the budget, it's just the federal budget has zeroed it out uh, at this stage. Um, we uh, know that the Coast Guard will be coming. There will be 3,700 employees, and there will be lots of opportunities on the uh, east side. Some of you may remember that we launched uh, a few months ago a uh, partnership with Microsoft, and we're looking for Microsoft to also uh, be a part of helping us to develop there and have a presence there uh, on the east side of the campus as over a period of time we become a, uh, an IT uh, hub uh, there uh, as well. We also will um, invest in a lot of other projects. Much of these dollars that will be invested there will be from the private sector, but we're investing catalytic dollars and finally after 23 years, right Victor, uh, being able to get the Skyland Town Center moving. We have an anchor tenant now. Uh, we know that at least one other will be wants to, wants to remain there, that is CBS. Uh, we have two other parcels, I think the, the uh, cost of which has to be settled by the courts. Uh, we own all of the uh, land now, is that right? And um, that will be turned over, the goal is to turn over to the developer January 1st, 2013, uh, the property for uh, moving forward. And there, by the way, will be probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 uh, residential units there as well, which will create an, a uh, built-in group of people uh, to use the amenities that will be created there. McMillan Reservoir, uh, that, will, that development will be underway. Uh, we are looking to create a training uh, effort there that will focus on allied health. Uh, we know that's right across the street from three major hospitals. The uh, uh, Veterans Administration, the Children's Hospital, and the Washington Hospital Center, and hope to be able to be a, a supplier of people who can qualify for the jobs that exist uh, in those uh, hospitals. And Walter Reed uh, will be one of the in big investments. That will be a, that is a hot commodity, and I think once we get the property turned over to the city, it will really take off and move uh, very very quickly. Um, in terms of workforce development, uh, we are. Uh, working, we work with the council to create a workforce intermediary uh, pilot. Uh, we are fully funding it at $1.6 million. Uh, it will focus on jobs in the construction and uh, hospitality uh, industries uh, in an effort to get people prepared for those jobs and also 
to uh, establish a pipeline or expand the pipeline with those who have such jobs uh, to offer. Uh, we certainly have focused on those through our One City, One Hire program. We now have gotten 2,100 people jobs in the last five months uh, through the One City, One Hire program uh, with, by partnering with over 500 firms uh, in the city. And we want to expand that to a much more systematic uh, approach uh, as we move forward. Um, we are, uh, unfortunately, we've lost around $44 million in federal grants. And when I say lost, they just simply expired and they have not, they're not being renewed uh, by the federal government. And sequestration uh, coming on January 1st could present even more uh, daunting uh, challenges to us in that regard. But we lost $6.6 6 .6 million in um, job development, workforce development funds uh, that uh, we are filling the gap. We're replacing a DOES, and in a like sum of money, as you will see, we're not able to replace uh, that. Um, we are uh, fully funding what we now call the One City Clean Teams. Uh, these are whatever you want to call them. They are people who are out in the streets uh, augmenting what we do in the Department of Public Works to keep our streets clean, and they will be fully funded in fiscal year 13. Uh, as will our match grant as we build, as we get, continue to expand our economy. Uh, we have a grant that helps us to expand our uh, export uh, promotion efforts uh, from the Small Business Administration and the Department of Commerce, and this is our match uh, sum. Um, we also, um, we also um, will fully fund the uh, nuisance abatement program, which we know is important to our uh, neighbors, uh, neighborhoods, and uh, we will provide $350,000 to maintain the uh, and manage the uh, Lincoln Theater. Uh, we're putting a million dollars of upgrades into the theater on the capital side, and this $350,000 will help the Commission on Arts and Humanities to manage it and develop a governance model that will endure over time. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Jack Evans, our council member from Ward 2, and the chairman of Finance and Revenue who's joined us. And Jack, when I finish this, if you would come up and say a few okay, words, I'd, I'd be happy to, to have you do that. Um, our second principle is to protect our most uh, vulnerable residents. And um, are we doing that to the extent that we would like to? No, we are not. There's a 3.2 percent increase in human support services funds. But there are also some areas where there will be reductions, and we have put some of those issues near, the, near or at the top of the list of contingencies that we would, would, would turn to uh, if there's additional dollars that will come into the city, and I'll go over those contingencies shortly. But additional investments include about $17 million in health care finance. Um, I see Bob Malson here, who knows probably better than any the, uh, the extent of uh, health care inflation. Uh, in this nation, which outstrips inflation in any other area. Most areas, 1 to 2 percent. Healthcare inflation is anywhere from 4 to 8 percent. And that makes the task of us, as well as every other state Medicaid program, incredibly difficult because it is the biggest budget in the city. In many states, it is the biggest budget. For us, it's about $2 billion uh, gross, far and away bigger than any other budget uh, in the city. And keeping up with the inflationary effects, almost impossible uh, in this economy. Additional $2.6 million in human services and in mental health, additional $9.2 million, which in part um, will help us to um, uh, keep, keep ourselves moving in the right direction uh, with the uh, Dixon Decree, which we're now out of after 37 years. Um, the Housing Authority uh, will get an additional $6.2 million in order to support the local rent supplement program. There are new units that are coming online. Uh, some of those are non-housing, non-profit housing providers. So there will be an additional $6.2 uh, million. We are putting, once again this year, money from the Housing Production Trust Fund uh, in to support the local rent supplement program because we're faced with seemingly impossible choices. And that is, if we don't do this, then we run the risk of people uh, who live in these uh, residences now not being able to be supported, and we can't do that. Um, we have more money, we think, that will be coming into the Housing Production Trust Fund uh, during the year that will allow us to continue uh, our, our uh, affordable housing efforts. And, you know, just so it's clear, we are continuing to um, invest uh, heavily 
uh, as much as we can at this stage into affordable housing. Um, since I've come into office, we've brought on board uh, 400 units of affordable housing, just a little bit over. And I was at a ground, uh, not a groundbreaking, a dedication ceremony yesterday for Eden Place uh, that not only is bringing online affordable housing, it is helping us with the new communities program uh, to be able to reduce the census at Lincoln Heights uh, and Richardson as we uh, substantially scale down the uh, capacity in those two developments. We also have um, uh, work going on beyond that 400, another 460 units of affordable housing uh, that are in the pipeline. Uh, DHCD has brought on over 700 units of housing uh, since January of 2011 and itself has uh, broken ground on 583 uh, more. So uh, we've got our comprehensive housing strategy task force that is working at this stage uh, over the next several months to try to help us uh, determine how we uh, introduce new strategies to, to uh, affordable housing but it is a difficult problem. We have seen the numbers of families increase in, in shelter uh, in the city. We probably have, I don't know, a third to a, you know, maybe a third to a quarter, maybe twice as many families in shelter at this stage because of the state of our economy and other factors. And we are struggling to try to be able to serve those families because of our own challenges. I've talked to mayors in other cities. They are experiencing the uh, same problem because of their own economic uh, challenges. And so, again, uh, we will continue to work to bring online affordable housing at various levels of the AMI uh, as, as, uh, you know, as the resources present themselves. But we also recognize that there is a continuing uh, need. Uh, in the area of mental health, we will bring on, we're bringing on 200 units of housing at a cost of $6.2 million to meet our commitment to the uh, Dixon uh, decree. Uh, we're out of that now after 37 years, and we want to make sure that we continue on the right path uh, there. Uh, moving on to the next uh, slide, slide 18, um, the uh, budget supports $10.7 million for WMATA, $9.1 million, $9 million in the uh, subsidy, and then $1.6 million to support our circulator system, which actually added another line uh, in the past uh, year, and that will have to be supported. Uh, through the performance parking program, we anticipate generating three and a quarter million dollars that will help to support our commitment to WMATA. And we will sustain, uh, the federal government has reduced its commitment to the, uh, it was committed to $150 million a year uh, for upgrades in the, uh, in the metro system, the WMATA system. They've reduced that to $135 million, but we, like Maryland and Virginia, will sustain our commitment at $50 million. Um, the uh, launch of the, the streetcar system will occur in 2013, the uh, 8th Street Benning Road system. We will also commence the building very soon of the maintenance facility, which will be along uh, that line and will actually have some job opportunities associated with it as well. And we have some ideas on how to facilitate the growth and development there. Um, the uh, streetcar funding is $237 million in our budget which at best I represent as a down payment. We think that this system over uh, 20 years of its evolution will cost around one and a half billion dollars. So we've got a long ways to go to be able to make, to create a 37 mile system. Um, and we have some financing ideas. I was just talking to our deputy mayor uh, the other day about some ideas that he learned uh, recently. We're gonna look at those ideas as a possibility to accelerate the uh, investments in the uh, system. Uh, we also are committed to overhauling our taxi system, um, and um, it needs to be overhauled. Uh, I had somebody say a little bit cynically, it was comical. Uh, I was talking about the colors of our cabs, and somebody in a meeting recently said to me, the most predominant color in the District of Columbia is rust uh, of our cabs. Uh, and we obviously don't, that we don't find that, having that reputation to be uh, very exciting. In any event, uh, we are looking at uh, putting in smart meters, which will help us connect to uh, OTR in terms of the uh, earnings that are being uh, realized by people who are in that business. We will, over the next six to 12 months, uh, equip all the cabs in the District of Columbia with credit card capacity so the people who ride the cabs will be able to pay with a credit card. 
And I've seen this, I've seen it in New York, there actually is a screen that comes up because the cab drivers are worried about this. It says, check this box if you want to leave 10%, 15%, or 20% as a tip. Uh, so you can easily make your choices uh, there as well. And we're going to do the same thing here. And we are moving towards a uniform color uh, of our cabs. Uh, we've got this. <laughs> we got some drawings. These, this, this is the beginning. Uh, thank you, Alan. Anybody want to see him? Okay. <laughs> that is not settled. This is an idea. I'm, I'm, I know I want uniform colors, but. Uh, Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. Who's going to pay for this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, there are some ideas in here. Woo! <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> I think you know in New York the cabs are all the same color, uh, and it's so identifiable. Uh, here, it's almost the only common denominator is that may have a light uh, on the top that you can identify at night coming down the street. And of course, if it's daytime, pretty hard to do that. I think we're one of the last places in the world, too, to not have that kind of uniformity uh, in our system. So uh, Ron Linton, who heads our Taxi Cab Commission, is working um, to bring on those advancements in our taxi cab system. Um, in terms of government efficiency and accountability, one of our headlines is the Department of General Services, which just came online in October. Uh, we brought together a lot of different agencies under one umbrella, uh, and we expect to have about $10 million of efficiency savings as a result of staffing uh, reduction, staff redundancies that will be eliminated, uh, energy retrofits and a variety of other efforts that will allow us to realize that level of savings in fiscal year 2013. We also have a gain sharing program that's being launched in DPW that will in, in incentivize our workers to have a better have a better vehicular safety uh, performance. They will be able to beyond the threshold. They will be able to share in the savings that will be realized. Uh, we're going to we're proposing to invest five million dollars in our sustainable DC initiative which will be rolled out, uh, the beginning of it will be rolled out in April uh, next month. Um, it will focus on nine uh, areas, uh, ranging from climate to food to water to uh, energy to transportation, a host of areas, and we think we will have the most comprehensive sustainability plan in the nation. Five months, six months after the first phase is rolled out, we'll have an implementation plan that will be ready uh, by the fall. We are fully funding the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. Uh, we are uh, funding fully the election for November 2012 now, and we're adding at least two positions to the Office of Campaign Finance to increase uh, its capacity. Principle three, uh, we wanted to make sure we accommodated Dr. Gandhi. Uh, we have his chart, his famous chart in here, uh, that shows that uh, not just that our budget is structurally balanced, but that our fund balance is begin, beginning to go up as we added $240 million to the fund balance with the surplus we just got the uh, audit on uh, about six or seven weeks ago. And frankly, I think Dr. Gandhi made our trip to New York a lot more pleasant than uh, it otherwise might have been. Um, the um, next slide, slide 22, uh, the... Uh, is the, is the overview uh, of the budget. It's a $9.4 billion gross uh, operating budget uh, consisting of 62.4% of local dollars, which to me is an interesting statistic because there are many people around the country who believe that the District of Columbia is funded fully by the federal government, and it's just not true. Two-thirds of the funding, like it is in virtually everywhere else, comes from uh, the uh, taxpayers' dollars here in the city, property taxes, income taxes, and sales taxes, not $5.9 billion. We have about 30 percent of federal funds at 5.8, most of which is Medicaid, and then the rest of it is from like special purpose uh, uh, efforts like cleaning up the Anacostia River or the Nursing Facility Quality uh, Care Fund, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, then you go over and look at the, the, the uh, distribution of those dollars, the $9.4 billion. Uh, the overwhelming majority goes into public education. Uh, Forty percent of it goes into human support services. And um, the, uh, th that's 60 percent of it right there. And the rest of it is pretty evenly uh, distributed. Uh, public safety is uh, about 12 percent, which is the next uh, largest uh, item. That's on the gross budget. Then on the local budget, the $5.9 billion distributed pretty similarly. Um, the um, economic uh, development area, contrary to popular belief, is only 2 percent because most of what they do is catalyze private dollars, right, uh, Victor? Uh, public education, 27 percent. Human support services, about the same. I think this is the first time ever that public education has eclipsed as a percentage, uh, not in terms of actual, uh, I mean, the level of dollars haven't go hasn't gone down. But uh, public education and human support services are about the same, and uh, public safety at about 16 percent, also almost a billion uh, dollars. Uh, now, we uh, started out with the challenge of uh, being told by the chief financial officer that our gap would be two hundred and uh, fifty two million dollars. What does that mean? The current services funding level budget? It means in order to do exactly what you do in the current fiscal year, in the next fiscal year, it's going to cost you two hundred and fifty two million dollars uh, more. And um, most of that growth, three quarters of it, were in the seven areas that you see listed there from the Department of Health Care Finance all the way down through uh, charter schools. Um, the uh, challenge that we were left with after accounting for an additional $101 million in revenue uh, coming in the door was closing a gap of $151 million. And you see how that's closed uh, on the next page, on um, page uh, 26. $151 million, the baseline budget uh, gap. Um, we got additional revenue estimate of $35, $36 million at the end of February. A technical adjustment in the financial, financial plan uh, led to us getting $23 million more. And then you factor in the additional cost of uh, student enrollment growth in DCPS, which is $64 million, um, and um, additional uh, Medicaid uh, funding requirements of 16, and we had a gap of $172 uh, million. And so we closed it. We closed that gap in two ways, uh, partially through expenditure cuts and then through uh, revenue uh, initiatives. Uh, expenditure cuts uh, totaled of the 172, 102, almost $103 million, and then about $70 million in revenue uh, initiatives. We have maintained our, uh, our, our debt cap that we are committed to. Actually, actually for those who don't know, the uh, D.C. Charter allows us to go up to 17 percent of debt, which means, of course, that would further reduce the amount of money we have to spend on other things in the operating budget. So we have capped it at 12 percent, um, which is not required by the Charter, but it allows other do more dollars to be spent than uh, on, uh, on uh, operating uh, dollars, o operating, the operating budget. Uh, we lost this year, I think I mentioned already, about $44 million uh, in federal funds. We were able to cover $22 million of that. Uh, we covered in those items. You see some of those I mentioned, MPD, DOES, mental health, uh, and the Department of Human Services. And then there's another almost $22 million we were not able to cover because the dollars simply weren't there. Uh, $7 million in DHS. Uh, the uh, Federal funds that we carried over from shelters and transitional housing, those dollars are gone. Uh, $1.6 million for other services in DHS, uh, about $7 million in DOES uh, and uh, DHCD, um, $6.1 million in uh, reductions in the Community Development Block Grant Program, which every mayor in the nation is complaining about, and then the home grants, which help in, in, with a facet of uh, housing. And so um, these, these are some of the areas that will experience uh, problems. I won't say problems. They will experience cuts uh, or not as much money as we would like to have to be able to fund them. Uh, the $102.7 million includes uh, a $23 million uh, area of savings in the Alliance Program, uh, which would involve restructuring. It will continue to cover primary, preventive, 
uh, and I think specialty care we talked about earlier today, but it does not cover hospitalization, uh, the uh, hospital costs that previously were covered for these. Now, many of the people who are in the alliance have already moved over to Medicaid, and I think predominantly now the population in the alliance program, I don't know, what do we have, how many pe people we have left, uh, Eric, in the uh, alliance program? About, uh, hey, about 20,000? Is it about 20,000? 20, okay. And they are, um, in substantial part, undocumented, um, you know, people in the, nation, in the uh, city. Um, and we are obviously deeply concerned about that. And you'll see how we've tried to address that in the event additional money comes in the door. Uh, we've adjusted. This starts to get a little bit eye glazing. But there's something called diagnostic related groupings that are, um, that are designed to establish rates for how much providers are paid. A certain set of conditions are put together and rates are determined for those groupings. Is that right, Linda? Okay. Uh, those groupings. And uh, we have reduced from 114 percent of the national average down, 114 uh, percent of coverage down to 98 percent. And I'm told, is it right that 89 percent is about the national average of what people do? So we're still above that. But, you know, not a lot of people will care about that. They will care about the fact that it's reduced from 114 to 98 percent and an $8 million uh, of savings. Also, we are, as we bring back children from uh, faraway places, we're bringing back more children from who are under the uh, custody, the care, commitment of DYRS. Uh, and we expect to save $5.6 million there. And uh, for those who haven't followed this, and a lot of people may not have, the number of children in foster care has reduced substantially uh, in the city. About 10 or 12 years ago, we had 3,300 children in care. We are now down to just a little bit over 1,700 uh, children uh, in the city who are in foster care, which I think speaks well. It means that children have permanent placements that they're in, and maybe some of, the, uh, some of our families who have been deeply troubled in the past are not to the same extent, uh, same number in trouble as they have been before. But it's good to see that number coming down. And then we're reducing overtime in the Department of Mental Health. Finally, uh, there are no uh, new taxes or, or fees that we are imposing. Um, we will, you can see some of the areas that are laid out there that we will generate additional dollars. We work closely with the CFO uh, around these to know that they, of course, are real because we wouldn't be able to do it if they weren't. Uh, <clears throat> the um, recovery of unpaid sales taxes uh, through credit card merchants in the city. Uh, getting implemented our central collection unit, uh, improving the collection of fees and fines uh, around rental housing uh, regulations, uh, allowing people not to be able to get a driver's license, frankly, um, if, they, if, they're, if they are delinquent, not being able to get a, their tax refund, uh, as well as other uh, ways. And then you can see the rest of this uh, there. Um, Again, introducing uh, traffic calming initiatives, which would generate $24.8 million, expanding the hours for uh, sale of alcohol. I think we're expanding by two hours. Is that right? Okay. And uh, reducing the inflation adjustment. And if, Eric, you want to explain that, you're welcome to do that. But um, this was delayed year after year after year. And uh, we're doing it now only for one year rather than five. Right, we were not retro, and that, that's essentially the standard deduction. We were trying to index it, because I did the legislation. We were trying to index it uh, so that these, the uh, standard deduction and the, the personal exemptions would go up automatically each year, and it became, as we moved into the recessionary period, it became unaffordable, and we had to put a pin in it uh, for a minute, maybe longer than a minute. Um, I think you all know about the One City Performance Review that we have been con uh, engaged in. We found $16 million of savings that are included in this budget. There are a number of other initiatives that we did not feel we could move forward with uh, at this stage uh, in the game. And uh, we are, are continuing to review those in hopes of finding additional savings. That will go on for the next several months. And hopefully by the beginning of the fiscal year, we may have identified some additional areas uh, for savings. The final thing I want to mention is that um, we have include a, included a uh, priority list of things that we would like to see funded. And we've transmitted it as a part of the Budget Support Act to the Council 
if additional revenue is uh, identified. And what you see are the first uh, 12. There are probably, I don't know, 25 or 30 uh, on the list. And the first 12 are uh, contained uh, here in, in the document you have. Um, restoring, putting, investing $7 million uh, into homeless services for the loss of uh, federal funds. Uh, $14.7 million in TANF uh, to be able to move forward. Uh, I assume many people know that the district never really uh, implemented the five-year rule. We were the only jurisdiction that didn't back from the 90s when this became the law. And frankly, we've had people receiving TANF. It really isn't even TANF. You can't call it temporary if people are receiving it forever. So we are now moving away from that, and we're trying to get people. Uh, it's going to be tough in the early going because there's so many people. But people who are coming in now, um, the DHS, the Economic Security Administration, is starting to work with them from day one around not whether your check comes on time every month, but that you've got to get a job. And we're going to work with you to try to make sure that you are prepared to be able to get a job because at the end of five years, there is no more support that can be provided. Um, the district, once it went past five years, was providing 100 percent of the dollars because the federal government would no longer provide dollars uh, for that. So uh, hopefully we can get additional funding for this effort. And David Burns, uh, who heads DHS, is one of the foremost experts in this area nationally. And we want to make sure we try to provide more resources for him to do that. Uh, third on the list is to restore the alliance uh, <clears throat> benefits, uh, $23 million. Um, fourth, to put money into the Housing Production Trust Fund, uh, which, which has been used to be able to support the local rent supplement program, which I spoke about earlier, uh, two impossible choices that we faced with, uh, but we were. Um, <clears throat> and then going down there, a couple of tax relief uh, items here as well, and that is being able to repeal the tax on municipal bonds and then uh, at the bottom being able to provide more tax relief to our small businesses in the city. This would generate, this would cost $10 million, and what would happen is it would reduce the uh, tax from $1.65, $1.65 per $100 of valuation down to $1.55. Uh, and provide that back to our small businesses in the city. You can see the others um, to try to invest more in, t in infant and toddler services, which is an investment in the future, to try to, more, to accelerate our investments in special education capacity building, uh, and so on and so forth. There will be a list. How many in there, Eric? About 30? 25? How many initiatives are there? 25. 25. And so they total down to $120 million. Uh, if we get more money, you go down as far as the list as you can. Uh, no doubt the council will have its own views on the priorities. And we look forward to working with them around that as well as these other uh, items. I don't know if Mr. Evans is coming back uh, or not. Uh, oh, okay. Anyway, he was here with us, and we appreciate him coming down. Um, so now we'll open up the questions from the press. Uh, Ed? I want to ask you, Mr. Mayor, about these uh, increased traffic calming initiatives. <laughs> Are they anything more than more speed cameras? In a substantial part, yes. Th that is what they are. They are speed cameras. Yes. Nothing else. It's more. Additionally, on top of that, MPD is going to enter into some pilot programs to look at other uh, areas where there's issues in congestion management. Uh, in uh, enforcement of crosswalks so pedestrians can cross safely uh, for vehicles that would speed through the crosswalk when there's a pedestrian present. So they have some pilot initiatives in there. Uh, they're also bringing in new technology in areas where uh, traditionally radar can't pick up vehicles, and that, that new equipment would be able to ensure that vehicles aren't speeding through tunnels in areas of that sort. I'll make sure the uh, questions come from the press. The other folks will get to over the next 56 days. Janetta, and then uh, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, since there is uh, such a shortage of funds, and you're looking at expanding educational uh, programs, especially your infant toddler, have you thought about means testing these programs at this point, so that only low income or you know a certain income of, uh, community of people are actually eligible for that? That seems to me that would be that might bring savings. That's my first question. Second question is, on the school modernization, you, you look like you're making a lot of investments which seem to go against the IFF study, which talks about 
you know, proposes some school closings. Did you take into account the proposal that the IFF study made when you developed your, uh, your two, 2013 budget and the, the forward plan? Um, on the first question, that's an excellent question, and I agree with you. Uh, and we look, that's exactly what we're looking at on the infant and toddler uh, services, that I don't think there's any way that we can or we should have the district taxpayers pay for every child who's six months or a year old or two years old. Um, we actually have reached, reached universality on the three and four year old programs because we're treating those like the beginning of school uh, now and every child gets to go to school. But on the infant and toddler services, I think we're going in the direct, exactly the direction uh, that you uh, indicated because we need to serve those who are quote unquote the neediest uh, first and that's where the priority will be placed. Um, the budget right now includes only an additional million dollars for next year, but we would want those slots to be able to go to children who live, you know, in some of the most economically challenged uh, situations. Um, yes, we have looked at that. Uh, we, we expect enrollments uh, probably to go up uh, in the schools, and there was, uh, I don't know if Deputy Mayor Wright is here uh, or not. He might want to talk about, I'm sorry he's not here to talk about the IFFF IFF study, which um, actually talks about how we focus more of our energy on the lowest performing schools in some of the most challenged uh, neighborhoods and could lead to school closings uh, over time. But I don't think we'll wind up investing in schools that are likely to be closed or they could wind up being charter schools because we're trying to work more closely with the charter community now uh, as well to make more District of Columbia buildings available uh, to them. <laughs> rather than having them to go out and finance these buildings in one way or the other. And the costs actually wind up in substantial part coming back to the district anyway. So the overall middle school, uh, not middle school, I'm sorry, elementary program that you have in your budget, which is a six-year program, uh, that, does that incorporate some of these schools that are questionable, low-performing schools that may very well uh, end up being closed, or does it not? I think it does not, because there's only 12 schools that are included in the next year. Um, and there's so many elementary schools in the District of Columbia that uh, I wish we could do more than 12, but it's probably a blessing in the sense of making sure that we don't wind up investing money in a school that otherwise would not be online. Um, so. Mayor, as mayor, you have essentially ahead, you have essentially two opportunities to set the course. I'm you have two opportunities to set the course for your administration. One is your state of the district address, and the other is your budget. Can you point us to your budget? Where in your budget there is something that you can say, this is a great initiative, this is new, this is taking the district government in a new direction? Well, I think, first of all, when you look at the investments uh, that we're making at, on the east end of the city uh, around infrastructure at St. E's, we are very committed to developing an in, in, in information technology uh, presence uh, uh, east of the river on the campus and try to use it as a catalyst to develop more job opportunities and more amenities uh, in those communities. We've got, as you know, the Coast Guard that's coming, but the question is how does the District of Columbia take advantage of that? We've proposed a center for innovation and uh, entrepreneurship on the campus that we believe will create more jobs. Uh, and frankly, when you look at the emphasis even in our schools on information technology, I, I, I consider that that emphasis on technology to be something that is unique, uh, unique to us. Can you indicate an initiative that the average resident voter who may not live east of the river can touch and feel, can relate to, other than new, new parking enforcement initiatives? Well, I think, I hope people can relate to the fact that we're creating new jobs. We've gotten 2,100 people back to work. Uh, we, we've developed new partnerships with firms. Um, we are working, we're working on trying to create an information technology presence in the city and in the schools. We've done that in, our, in, in terms of our curricula in the schools, as well as bringing Microsoft to bear. I, I, wanna, I don't think that that is any small uh, issue, to say the least, because that is the way of the future. I don't know how many uh, meetings that we've been to with what is a burgeoning technology presence in the city. I just went a couple of weeks ago to an event that had about 600 firms represented over at 18th and L Streets uh, Northwest. I um, have worked directly myself with our staff to uh, attract firms to the District of Columbia, to keep firms in the District of Columbia. 
I think, frankly, that is probably the biggest area of economic development that we have before us right now. And I talked about that in the State of the District uh, address in terms of creating a new economy, and we're going to continue to focus on that. Now, uh, is everybody with their hand up? Remember, I guess they are. The press. Okay. Uh, we'll start here with you. Uh, two questions. One, the alcohol sales, does that apply to bars and restaurants or just No, I think it's package. Is it, is it, is, I think it's package sales. Both. Both. Okay. Sorry. Yes, both. Okay. So that, does that mean that bars and restaurants could then feasibly be open until? Well, we probably would do it anyway, at least around the inauguration. We know that's a single event. You want to talk about that further, Eric? The new hours uh, for off-premise establishments, uh, it would allow the sales from, which used to start at 9 a.m. to start at 7 a.m. Additionally, for the on-premise sale of alcohol, uh, which is, goes from 2 a.m., uh, it would go to 4 a.m. on weekends, 3 a.m. on weekdays. Uh, additionally, as the mayor pointed out, uh, for the inauguration, uh, we continue with the extended hours that happened during the last inaugural, and that would bring in an additional 751000 from that. I don't think we've had any conversation. Has anybody talked with them? We will. Okay. Uh, obviously, this wouldn't, if it's, if it's, you know, is approved, it doesn't become effective until next October, uh, anyway. Yep. On the loss of $7 million to the homeless services uh, program, so how, how will that impact the growing number? Well, I think we'll be able to, you know, continue our permanent supportive housing programs, but we, there is no question that we, we are overrun with additional families uh, in shelter at this stage, and we are deeply concerned about um, how we will handle that. We've got, we've created more capacity at D.C. General Hospital, but that's not really an answer. That's, that's a Band-Aid. Uh, and we're not alone in this. Every city in the nation is facing the same problem. So I guess, you know, as a short-term solution, we're hoping that additional revenue will come through, uh, you know, come through the door over the next several months and that we'll be able to address this. This is one of the reasons why we put it at the top of the list. Uh, but um, can't spend what we don't have. Um, I didn't see much on libraries. Is there anything I'm sorry. on libraries? Is there any? Well, we put in money for Rosedale to make sure it's staffed when it opens. I think it's the only new library that's open opening. <clears throat> we also, as you well know, on this past October, we restored money for uh, the Sunday hours, but there is no additional money to restore any additional, you know, nighttime hours or Sunday hours in the uh, neighborhood branches. James. Okay. Identify yourself, would you? Uh, Eric Hart with the Associated Press. Okay. Um, can you talk, Mr. Mayor, a little bit more about the significance of the um, re uh, ethics, regulatory agency increase in funding and the impetus for that? Well, I'm assuming most people know the Board of, uh, Elect Board of Ethics and Government Accountability was approved. Um, I've signed it, so this would allow the staffing uh, of that, uh, that board, like the Board of, Eth board of Elections and Ethics, which will now be the Board of Elections, and uh, whatever is required to get it up and running. I assume the importance of it has already been established. Bill? Mr. Mayor, um, the commission that was looking at public education finance, the commission you helped to create, just recently uh, completed its work. And um, it gathered a lot of information and made some recommendations about trying to improve the uniformity uh, funding between the uh, public charter and, and the traditional public schools. Uh, and it talked about um, changes in the uniform formula that we to uh, What is there in this budget that, that is any of the commission's work uh, I think, it's, I think, Bill, it's going to take some time. We didn't have enough time in the preparation of this budget to take all of those recommendations and, and to um, evaluate them, analyze them, and, but we will, we will do that as we go forward. But obviously we were working on a timeline to be able to complete the budget. Um, there are some people who believe we should continue with the uniform form formula. There are others who believe that it should be substantially revamped. Um, and as you well know, because I think you follow this closely, there wasn't unanimity of feeling either uh, in the commission. 
uh, about much of anything. I mean, people had strongly held views, but not a lot of unanimity on those views. If I could just follow up, this wasn't exactly part of the Commission's charge, but they talked about it anyway, which is the question of facilities and charter schools. Wouldn't you save a bunch of money if charter schools had broader access to a considerable portfolio of empty CPS buildings rather than paying or renting commercial space? I think that's correct, and I think that I've indicated both in my words and my deeds that I support, you know, charters being able to move into some of our public school uh, buildings. Um, I think we, we had the Eagle Academy that's moving into, I don't know what it is, it's, it's one, of, one of the buildings, uh, McGogney, that's right. I was on the council when we did Clark. Uh, there have been several others that have been done, and so I believe, yeah, I believe that that would, uh, you know, it, it puts them in a school environment also rather than perhaps in our, an environment that has to be accommodated to a school environment. Tom? Uh, can you talk about what the budget does for the Office of Campaign Finance and um, your opinion on whether it's enough to increase their auditing capacity? Well, we've added two positions. I, I believe, and I've said this, uh, you know, some this week, that we really need to take a comprehensive look uh, at our, at our uh, uh, campaign finance uh, approaches, laws, rules, regulations, whatever. And that would probably take, be, include taking a look at the Office of Campaign Finance. I've also said that I thought that they were, they were understaffed, whether they're understaffed by 2, 10, 20, 40. I really don't know the answer to that. But taking a comprehensive look at it would give us uh, the ability to, to make more informed uh, decisions about that. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me make everybody the first round, and I'll come back, okay? Uh, Debbie. I, I want to ask a, a bit about Medicaid. I know in the past, what, the first question is, what percentage of Medicaid does the federal government pay for the District of Columbia? Because I know it can vary from, from the states. And then number two, in the past, the city has had um, considerable trouble making what's been spent on Medicaid and getting that approval through the federal government. Has that changed at all, or is there money in here to help um, make that accountability, our accountability system better? The first question was around the percentage. It's a 70-30 participation, 70% uh, federal. And I'm assuming you're talking about disallowances, that the government will claim for a certain service and then for whatever reason is not, uh, is disallowed. It's almost like, I mean, think of Medicaid as an insurance company, which is what it is. And the Department of Health Healthcare Finance in the city is the administrator of that insurance company. Um, and claims are filed, and the insurance company can, you know, allow those claims or not allow those claims. Those claims then also then are audited or reviewed by the federal government as a part of an auditing process. And we have had, in the past, we've had a substantial disallowance, uh, disallowances, which means the money has already been spent, the money has already been received, and then we have to give back to the federal government. The Department of Mental Health experienced, experienced this uh, back in the early 2000s, you know, one, two, and three. And I think there was about a, almost $100 million of disallowances, which, by the way, under Steve Barron's leadership has really been completely uh, cleaned up working with health care finance. But um, we're, not, we're not experiencing those, that, that, we don't have that kind of experience uh, nearly to that extent uh, as, as in the past. As a matter of fact, CFSA, uh, which has uh, uh, children who would be Medicaid eligible opted out of the program because of the concern that the documentation required to be able to get reimbursement, reimbursements was not adequate to be able to withstand uh, a review. They, they went into what's called a 4E program, well, they're in the 4E program anyway, but solely in the, the Title 4E program, which is a child welfare program. Does it, excuse me, it doesn't cover uh, with the same breadth, the number of kids, or um, the same number of services. I think they're about ready to go back in. But we're not going to put ourselves back in a position again where we're likely to say, you know, for the immediate moment, we're going to collect, you know, a few million dollars and then wind up because of inadequate record keeping, inadequately supported claims to have to give back uh, money once those audits uh, are done and uh, the federal government reclaims its dollars. Um, Mr. Mayor, you have <coughs> below the line of services that you want to find money to come to the building, which seems to me runs counter to what you just did with your surplus 
where you said this money has to go into um, into you know, uh, fund balance or it has to be used for only one time spending. That's one issue. But what I'm I'm wondering is why don't you use this as a moment, an opportunity to kind of discuss with the public what the government can and can't do. I mean, you're spending now 70% of the budget is already being spent public safety, education, and and human services. You're proposing in this 25 list to increase that percentage of <coughs> areas. Why would you do that? Why don't you just say, this is all we can do, y'all. Thank you very much, and move on. Why are you going to continue giving people this false hope? I think, I think in a sense, that is what we've said. Uh, we haven't included those in the budget. At the same time, I think that I, I happen to believe that there are some critical needs that are represented there. The number of families who are uh, homeless is increasing exponentially in the District of Columbia. The need to invest in families on TANF uh, to be able to get them to another place, I think, is a is a critical need. The need to make sure that we can provide basic health care to the people in the District of Columbia is a critical uh, need. And frankly, as we go out, and that's exactly what we're going to do, Janetta, we're going around the city. There will be a town hall meeting in every one of the um, wards in the city. I have charged every one of the uh, cabinet members with reaching out to the stakeholders who they uh, serve every day. I think we will have, during this 56 days, a pretty strong statement uh, from people around the city, uh, whether they believe these issues should be addressed or whether they think they should not be. I don't have any doubt that there are people probably sitting right in this audience who will make an, a, a, an impassioned plea for supporting people who are homeless or, or supporting more people who, who need more uh, health care services. So I think there will be a diversity of views about that. And uh, we've done the best job we could in putting together a budget in the, within the, uh, the constraints of the dollars we had available. I tried to make a statement about these are other needs that we recognize, but we can't fund them. And uh, at the end of the day, a decision could be made. Uh, clearly, that says, um, yeah, we got some more money, but it's not going into the, any of this. Uh, these, these areas, you know, just won't be funded. Uh, but at least the discussion has been put on the table by the, um, you know, by putting out this list of additional needs that haven't been met. Can I just follow on, on one thing? Uh, you did your, your citizen summit, and, and the citizen summit identified <coughs> Uh, what their priorities were. I think, uh, as I remember, affordable housing was a major issue for, for most of the people. How do you see your budget comporting with uh, the issues that were raised in, in the Citizen Summit? Well, I think we've tried to do the best job we can of responding uh, to those needs. I think, you know, some of the efficiencies in government are reflected, like in DGS, with the $10 million uh, that we're saving in bringing together those uh, components. Uh, the focus on technology, that was certainly discussed uh, at, the, uh, at the summit. Um, the affordable housing issue, which was uh, discussed there as well, we immediately, in a matter of days thereafter, appointed the Comprehensive uh, Housing uh, Task Force that um, will um, hopefully give us some insights on how to better finance affordable housing in the District of Columbia. And frankly, by putting money in where we can right now in terms of the uh, local rent supplement program to sustain those people and the increasing numbers of people, I think we added, what, $6.2 million to the local rent supplement program? So uh, to the extent we could, Janetta, we've tried to reflect uh, in those, pr those priorities uh, in the dollars that we're spending. But we also recognize that there's just not enough dollars to do all of the things that people would like to do. But it will give the, the inclusion of the list that we've had will give an opportunity for that debate to unfold over the next two months. I'll take one more question and then we'll, uh, you haven't had a chance to. Uh, yeah, the performance parking switch, so is that, does that mean taking the revenue away from, I think it was originally meant to be performance parking in neighborhoods, funds would go back to those neighborhoods for transportation projects and now it's going to WMATA. Is that correct? You want to talk about that, Eric? I think I know what you're talking about in terms of it. If it's generated here, it goes back here. I think initially all parking meter revenue in the city was dedicated towards WMATA needs. Uh, I, I believe what you're referring to is there's some council legislation to take the performance parking specifically and try to put it in a special reserve restricted fund. Uh, this does take that funds and the expansion of the performance parking and put it back towards solving uh, the significant funding needs of WMATA. There's, I think, about $10.7 million more 
at WMATA that needed to be funded. Uh, so this funding was needed to be able to help solve that gap over there and maintain our commitment uh, both to the regional transit needs from WMATA and then also our local uh, circulator and non-regional bus services here. So it had to be used in order to cover the gap at WMATA. All right. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.